Hello there. In this week's Data Vault Radio Show, we look back at how you can build great databases for small enterprise. I sit down and have a chat to Mike Kalusik from Infovia, and we catch up on the latest news. All that and more coming up right now. Hi there, welcome to this week's episode of the Data Vault radio show. This episode, like all of them, is actually linked into the Data Vault Innovators community. It is a free online community where you can go and join up and talk to other people who work in the industry from around the world. It's a great free resource to ask questions of experts, but also to get to connect to other people who work within the same field as you do. I'm your host, Paul Barlow, and today we've got a really fascinating episode for you. I'm going to be sitting down with Mike Kalusik from Infovia to talk about well, him and what he does. And at the same time, well, a little bit after, because that's how time works. It's linear from our perspective. Afterwards, we're going to sit down and look at a clip that we did from a masterclass last year, looking at the best sort of management systems for data for small enterprises, because we deal a lot with big enterprises and what they need, but sometimes small enterprises are, you know, they're needing the same kind of help as well. But before all of that, let me just remind you that next week, in fact, in about a week, uh, Scalefree is hosting the first DVIC Summit in London in the United Kingdom. It's completely free to head along. You just need to register in advance so they can organize things like how many seats they need to pull out and the catering they've got to organize. Please tell them about the catering. I've heard horror stories about English food. Uh, everything's boiled. I don't know if that's true. I've not been to England myself, but you know, make sure that you take care of the catering stuff. It's really important to make sure that you enjoy the event in any way that you can. But you can find all that information on scalefree.com on their website. It's all linked. And there are links as well in the DVIC forum. So please make sure you check them out. And if you've got nothing better to do next Thursday, or if, and if you do and you still want to go and head to a great networking event where you meet other people and learn a whole bunch, that's certainly an option for you. Now, before we jump into that interview with Mike, let's have a look at the news for this week. Well, Gemini 1.5 continues to lead the headlines. This week, it's not for how blazingly fast its performance is. Instead, it's because it's become woke. If you haven't heard, Google were forced to switch off the text to image generator due to it producing historically inaccurate images such as female popes, Asian Vikings, and very bizarrely, black Nazis. Google Senior Vice President Brad Hakar Raghaven wrote, it's clear that this feature missed the mark. Some of the images generated are inaccurate or even offensive, adding that Gemini does sometimes overcompensate in its quest to show diversity. Raghaven gave a technical explanation for why the tool overcompensates. Google had taught Gemini to avoid falling into some of the classic AI traps, like stereotypically portraying all lawyers as men. But our tuning to ensure that Gemini showed a range of people failed to account for cases that should clearly not show a range. If you ask for a picture of football players or someone walking a dog, you may want to receive a range of people options. You probably don't just want to receive images of people from one type of ethnicity or any other characteristic. However, if you prompt Gemini for images of a specific type of person, such as a black teacher in a classroom or a white veterinarian with a dog, or people in a particular cultural or historical context, you should absolutely get a response that accurately reflects what you ask for. Interestingly, one of the reasons he cites for the problem is that over time the model became way more cautious than we intended and refused to answer certain prompts entirely, wrongly interpreting some very anodyne prompts as sensitive. This led the model to overcompensate in some cases and be overconservative in others, leading to images that were embarrassing and wrong. This isn't the first time that Google has got tangled up in an image misclassification debacle. Back in 2015, software engineer Jackie Alcine pointed out that image recognition algorithms on Google Photos were classifying his black friends as gorillas. Google said it was appalled at the mistake and apologized and promised to fix the problem. However, the fix was to block its image recognition algorithms from identifying gorillas altogether. It will be interesting to see how Google handles it this time round in the merry-go-round. We'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on the subject and more. Check out the forums and make sure you become a member of the DVIC page. It's a great way to get around and have comments said about what's going on in the news. In public sector news, the 2023 state CIO survey conducted by the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, or NASCIO, in the United States has shed light on the current state of data governance maturity among state governments. 
revealing significant gaps that could hinder the effective implementation of generative AI technologies. With the majority of states in the early stages of developing their governance structures, the survey underscores the urgent need for enhanced data management practices to unlock the full potential of AI in the public sector. Data professionals are likely to concur that AI readiness is not just about the technology, but also involves preparing the data that fuels it. This survey revealed an alarming lack of formal data literacy programs, with 84% of states lacking such initiatives. This gap in data literacy is crucial as it impacts the ability of different agencies to effectively integrate their data into a cohesive AI-powered tool. As one CIO puts it, over the next three years, technological advancements and their impact on society will occur at unprecedented levels. AI is the next technology revolution and will change how people work, live and thrive, and will ultimately transform the global economy. State government information officers will chair new technology boards where ethical use and equity policy decisions are determined as each state embraces generative AI, eliminates the digital divide and considers future workforce knowledge, skills and capabilities. For more on this insightful piece of research and to access your own copy, check out the link below. In data governance news, GeekWire reported on Codified. The Seattle-based startup has emerged with a novel solution aimed at revolutionizing how companies manage internal data access standards. Led by Yathath Gupta, a veteran with over 14 years at Microsoft focusing on Azure data management and industry heavyweights such as former Snowflake CEO Bob Muglia and high-profile executives from SAP and Microsoft. Codified's mission is powered by Gupta's extensive experience in data governance, leveraging generative AI to simplify the creation of data access policies using plain English. The startup's platform aims to address the common challenges businesses face in managing who has access to data, for what purposes, and duration. Gupta's research indicates a reliance on in-house engineering for such tasks, which can be inefficient and prone to errors. Codified offers a promising alternative by automating the process, thus hoping to streamline operations and enhance security. This initiative comes at a crucial time when data regulations are tightening, cybersecurity investment is on the rise, and the demand for data to fuel AI systems is increasing, signaling strong market potential. Codified's backers, Madrona Capital, said that the $4 million funding round closed this week. Quote, data is widely acknowledged to be an important asset for nearly every company. But managing access to this exponentially growing and critical asset relies on manual processes that are cumbersome, error-prone, and extremely time-consuming to audit. Codified is built for any company wrestling with data governance solutions, offering just-in-time access and protection in alignment with company policies. Right, that's it for the news this week. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to have your say as a community member. Jump onto the DVIC forums that I've mentioned in the past down there in the description it's super simple now let's jump over to this week's interview i had a chance to sit down and chat with infovires mike kalusik he's a fascinating guy and i have to admit i kind of get will Riker vibes from him and that's not a bad thing at all i mean who doesn't trust number one anyway let's sit down and meet mike kalusik First of all, Mike, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I know there's a little bit of a time zone difference between where we are, but it looks like you've got a lovely view behind you, so it can't be can't be all yeah, bad like there at the moment. Corner office on the 70th floor, you know. If you believe that, I've got some land in Florida I can sell you. <laughs> I've got a bridge that you can chuck into that sales package as well. Hey, um, first question for you. What do you think is the most important thing that people need to know about what you do, what your company does, what Infovia does? Yeah, sure. No, appreciate you asking. So Infovia, is a, we're a holistic data strategy development and execution company. So what that means is we come in and we'll work with our clients to not only, you know, a lot of times they'll come and say, I need a data warehouse. We're like, well, you need a data warehouse, but you really need to think about your whole ecosystem there. And so what we'll do is we'll work with them to put that strategy together, make sure that they're asking for enough budget, and we help them put together a roadmap so they can get from point A to point Z uh, successfully. So not only do we help them build and architect their data warehouse, but then we'll work with them to bring in data governance, access control, manage services, you know, making sure that their data loads on a regular basis. Um, we're, we're industry agnostic. We've been in oil and gas, education, finance, insurance, so on and so forth. Um, really, you know, if you have data, you need Infovia is what it comes down to. Uh, we're big advocates of automation. We work with a lot of automation tools. Um, you know, we're big believers that if, um, if you focus let the let the tool focus on the mundane stuff like sling and code 
uh, and you focus on the art of architecting your solution, you're ultimately going to be able to invest more effort into a, a good solid solution than if you try to go in and just brute force code everything yourselves. Plus, we can typically build a data warehouse for a client in a fourth the time of doing it the old fashioned brute force way. So, um, you know, we've, we've built probably close to 40 data warehouses around the world. And through that process, we've refined a lot of our best processes so that we bring that to bear with all of our clients. And currently, we're actually um, building a new tool in-house leveraging AI so that we can hyper-automate that automation. So we can now take some textual input and from that textual input around a job description or a business process, we can actually generate a data model. So it's pretty exciting what's happening in the industry. It's moving so fast at the moment. How did you get into the industry? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny story because really for me, um, I, my plan in high school was to be a surgeon. I wanted to go to medical school oh. and I wanted to uh, practice medicine. And then I, I started taking some programming classes in high school and I was really excited by the fact that I could create a functional application just by writing some code. And of course, back then it was much more archaic than it is today. And the capabilities have just expanded tremendously. But that was kind of, you know, what happened. So I ended up trading in my medical education for a computer science degree and started my career as a software engineer and just loved it and worked for a lot of very large organizations, some Fortune 10 organizations. And then I also uh, worked for some really small ones. But through that, I learned all the aspects of IT. And what I found as I was joining these new organizations over time is I often found them coming to me, asking me to move into some leadership roles. And realized that that was just something that I had a knack for. And so I started building and, and leading teams internationally at some of these large organizations. And as I looked in the rearview mirror, I realized that I had really had the opportunity to lead just about every aspect of IT throughout my career. Um, a lot of the times I did it kicking and screaming. I'm like, hey, I want to go back over there and I want to sling some code. That was fun. Uh, but God obviously had a bigger plan for me because in the end, I realized that what I really needed was to be more well-rounded and diverse in what I'm doing. And so what that ended up doing for me is gave me that diverse background. So now as I work with our clients or when I work with, you know, the whole IT organization at our clients, I understand what the infrastructure guys concerns are and the software development guys concerns and the data guys concerns and the security guys concerns uh, because I've walked in their shoes before. So for me, it was really a lot of, uh, of a journey to get here. I did a lot of data architecture along that journey. And then a couple of years ago, uh, the founder of Infovia approached me and asked if I would be willing to come in and, and lead the organization. He wanted to stay on the technical side, and I had an itch to uh, develop some business skills. And uh, I had a background in that, and so it kind of was a natural pairing for us. So he stays more as our principal architect, and I stay more as our operations leader. That sounds like a really good mix uh, in, in terms of, of what you bring to the table as well as how you work within the company itself. And yeah, the, the way that you guys seem to gel really well together. That's not a bad place to be actually it's been a great partnership it really has yeah and so how do you unwind then well <laughs> for me i've always been an adrenaline junkie so i don't know if that's sitting back and then relaxing um it's kind I, of the I'm opposite of relaxing. Cool. it really is but for me it's unwinding i love to crank up the music and i love to go fast so whether it's skiing or driving a car or my motorcycle up some windy mountain road you know, and I was, you know, I, when I used to live in uh, Southern California, um, there was this canyon that took you to the, to the Pacific Ocean. And I would always try to beat my previous time getting through that canyon to the Pacific Ocean. Not the wisest thing in the world, but uh, that's just kind of the way I'm wired. So I would always do that. I'm also a very competitive person. Uh, we love to play a lot of strategy games in my family. And so we have a lot of game nights together. And it seems like they always turn into, uh, you know, my wife and five kids, let's all gang up and beat dad because supposedly dad always wins, but dad doesn't always win. <laughs> but that's that's the belief. So and then I also play racquetball with my kids. Um, it's a great sport. We love doing it. And um, it's a great workout. So and then on the lighter side, um, I love to be in the outdoors. So I'm an avid hunter mm -hmm. um, and uh, I like to backpack and things like that. So so there's a lot of different things I can do to unwind. That sounds amazing. I, that that strategy for the game is how my wife or ex wife plays Monopoly. It, it's everybody is a, is a victim she needs to attack, but it just sounds like you're always living fast. That's a fantastic way to do things. Yeah, my wife says my spiritual animal is a shark because she says I would die if I stopped moving. <laughs> I love that. It's brilliant. Um, what about things like reading? Then do you, do you read? 
much. I do. Yeah, I, I try to read a lot. Um, I do a lot of ebooks. Actually, I do all my fiction on ebooks and then my nonfiction in print books because I like to mark them up. Perfect. So, yeah. So, uh, my fiction stuff that I, I, I did a stint in the army. Uh, I was a tank mm -hmm. commander for nine years and there was a part of me that really wanted to go special forces and that, that itch was still there. And so I read a lot of books along those lines. So I've been reading Jack Carr's Terminalist series, you know, got turned into an Amazon series as well. Great mm -hmm. story. Um, I'm working my way through the Black Autumn series as well, if you're familiar with that, about kind of a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, but then on the technical side, um, I was recently doing uh, an interview with uh, some other folks that are leaders in the industry, and they were heavily recommending uh, Doug Laney's book, Infonomics. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I picked that up, and that's kind of the next uh, technical book that I'll be reading here shortly. I was going to ask, what was the last book that you read? Well, the last book, I, well, the last technical book, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. I've been spending a lot of time on nonfiction lately or fiction lately. Nothing wrong with that at all. I totally endorse that as an option. <laughs> that, that's that's my unwind as well is get, turn off the brain and just enjoy the story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. It, it's the best way to enjoy something by not thinking about it. Things that make you think when you're trying to relax just aren't fear. They're not, they're not playing fear. Um, do you have a favorite piece of science fiction? You know, I I grew up um, actually watching the Star Wars series in the theater. That kind of dates me, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I've always had a fascination with things that sort of push the science fiction envelope. And then if you package that up with a good thriller story, I'm a sucker for it every time. So uh, we, we kind of gravitate towards a lot of those types of movies and anything with action, um, I'm in. So um, we... We do a lot of movies in our family, all the Marvel movies, um, but then we'll also do a lot of the sort of bleeding edge science fiction stuff as well. Any recommendations? Seen anything decent lately? Now you put me on the spot. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> well, so I had a friend message me last night, actually, who, who's the world's biggest Dune fan. And so they've just gone and seen Dune 2 and didn't enjoy it, which I thought was really strange. The, 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 the little changes in the from the book to the movie with things that annoyed him so much when he watched the movie, because he's that much of a purist. And I, I always find it fascinating to see how people get so sort of involved with something like it. Yeah. It's science fiction. It's obviously not real, but that you see how in, in grow, engrossed and engaged they are about the little minutia of the details. And it's always fascinating to find out what people enjoy about it, but also what pisses them off about it. <laughs> Well, it's funny as I never read the Dune books and my family wanted to go see the movie. We thought it was a cool science fiction movie. And I was like, this movie makes zero sense because I had no context for it. And if you like, if yeah. you read the books, it made perfect sense, I suppose. But if you didn't read the books, I was lost throughout the whole movie. So, yeah. so that wasn't a good example. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I mean, personally, I like the fact that it's got to be the only major film series out there with a main character named Paul. It's not very common. So I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. Um, tell me, do you have any pet peeves? Anything that just like, like little irritations that annoy you, like changing books into movies? <laughs> you know, actually, I, I think my biggest pet peeve I've always kind of carried with me is, is um, people that have an attitude of minimalism. You know, going back to my army days, um, I was in charge of uh, physical fitness for my unit. And for me, I, I always wanted to get a perfect score, do the most push up, sit ups, run the fastest, and all of that. But I had other people in the unit that all they wanted to do was just pass. And they had so much more in the gas tank, but they would quit. And I see that in the corporate world as well sometimes, where you see people that are, I'm only going to do as much as I have to do to keep my job. I'm not interested in moving the needle. And for me, it's like, why not pursue excellence in everything you do? Why not, you know, look to be um, giving your end users, your clients, your stakeholders, your managers, whatever the case is, give them the best product, byproduct of your work that you can possibly give to them. You know, a lot of people look at quality as though it's optional or, hey, other people will catch my mistakes so I don't have to look for them myself. You know, when I was leading software engineering teams, I would always make it very competitive and say, you know, that, that software engineer should never let the person downstream catch what they missed. And then the QA person, same thing. And then that user acceptance tester, same thing. So that by the time it got into the hands of the end user, there nobody was gonna trip over anything in the first five minutes. Um, we we want to we want to deliver quality to the people that uh, that we serve, um, and that means you have a strong attention to detail. You strive for excellence, and and you don't stop at 
you know, mi a minimalist effort. You really, sh you know, shoot for the moon in everything that you do. And you'll have very elated customers. You'll have elated employees that work with you because they appreciate that you invest in them. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, everybody wins if we just, you know, ratchet up our game and, and not settle for something minimalistic. I love that. That, that is absolutely spot on. It bugs me so much when people just do the bare minimum, especially having had teenagers recently and it's like their, their stock standard operating system is do the bare minimum. It, it, you're absolutely right though. You're absolutely spot on. Um, I think that's the perfect place to end this. It's been highly informative. So thank you very much, Mike. It's much appreciated. Um, where can people find more information about the company? Just go to infovia.com. Pretty simple, just uh, seven little letters. Um, and uh, everything is there. There's a contact us page there as well. So if you want to reach out, you can uh, do that through that link. And uh, love to hear from people. Appreciate the opportunity today. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. And I, I must apologize because my accent makes me say InfoVia instead of InfoVia. Via feels like a really strange word in my mouth. I'm not used to it, but I'll practice. I will definitely <laughs> practice. Awesome. Thank you very much. You bet. Hey, I want to thank Mike for joining me for this week's interview. He's always given me like Will Riker number one vibes, and I am totally down for that because Will Riker as number one is, you know, he's awesome. He's awesome. Anyway, one of the problems that I've had over the years is working with smaller enterprises, not like Will, I guess, who worked on the largest enterprise. Again, strange segue, I apologize, but smaller enterprises is what I've worked on, including some that have worked with some of the biggest names in tech, like Apple, for example, or Google. But the problem that we've always had is that, uh, well, small enterprises tend to screw things up a little bit when it comes to their data management because they're small. Everything gets done in a rush and you don't have time to focus on things. And sitting down talking to somebody like Mike kind of reminded me that, you know, small enterprises have a lot on their plate as well as big enterprises. And that's why I thought I'd show you this clip that we did last year during a masterclass, looking specifically at how you can best find data management systems that work for small enterprises. While we deal with big enterprises all the time, small ones are really important to our economy, to what we do as an industry, to what they do for their industries. So let's have a chat with uh, Julian Redmond, Michael Oshimke, and Knowles Eberson around what the best systems that could be put in place are for small to medium enterprises. Um, I run a small computer repair business, uh, but we're looking at getting accreditation to work with a much bigger global brand. So we need to update our data management structures so they'll work for us, access some historical data and comply with both outside organisations, own bespoke data management systems and GDPR. Data Vault feels like the right fit, um, but what are the steps that we should go through to confirm this and what should we do to prepare our business for the changes? So, Michael, given that you are our GDPR mm -hmm. expert, we'll start with you. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, the first thing is what I would, um, um, what, what I hear sometimes is that the, the complaint essentially that Data Vault is good for uh, very large enterprises, but not or, or enterprise data systems, but not for the small case. And I don't agree with that. Um, if you have, um, let's say, a low set of requirements, the data vault is also very simple. Uh, it could, could be just be a, let's say, a, um, a non disaster link about the maybe service requests and then some hubs around it for customers, the products, maybe the store where you do, did the repair and so on. A couple of satellites on the hubs, maybe a non disaster satellite on the non disaster link. Very sp simple design. And then you can quickly derive a star schema from this, just visualize it out essentially. Um, so in a very small case, the data vault is also simple as long as you have um, a low number of requirements. But then, yeah, sure, when you have GDPR is a requirement, it's not actually, it's just one more requirement, essentially. So the, uh, the idea would to split the satellite based on the personal classification of the incoming attributes. So you have a bit, a bit more entities, right? Um, so that's number one. So start with a small use case. Um, maybe if you're, if you're a smaller case, then you have less requirements, and then the data should, look, uh, should be more simple, essentially. And then what I would uh, typically do is, in order to introduce data vault in a, in a client, we start in the first step, um, we start with um, a sprint where we assemble the team, where we make sure we have the resources available, the, 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 the servers, the infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure, and so on. Um, the room where we can work, the, the licensing uh, of the tools that we need, the laptops, the user account, and so on. 
And then in the next sprint, we look at an architecture. So um, you might have already something in mind, how you want to set up the data vault enterprise data warehouse. So you look at some layers, maybe some staging areas, maybe in the data lake, maybe some um, raw data vault layer where you have the, um, the raw data, the business vault, and the information mask. Set it up and see if you can shoot some data, some actual data from an actual source, all through the layers into the target. Once you're done with that, next sprint would then focus on the um, implementation of the um, of some business values, some actual reports, sprint by sprint. Essentially, that's that's the uh, basic idea how I would how I would essentially introduce data vault to the business or to the to the organization. Mm. And we certainly know of lots of people who have built and managed data vaults by themselves as the single single resource in uh, in an organization. Knowles, I know you you did exactly that. Um, do you have any perspective on this particular question? There's a couple of things that comes to mind. Uh, and I'm in, in agreement with Michael that, in fact, I'll be a little bit more extreme. The smaller the organization, the more they need a data vault. They will suffer mm -hmm. from less integration because it's a smaller organization, therefore less, less development across a strategic approach or those type of things. So they will struggle with the the big organization problems more so than they do with large organizations, which do drive out some of the integration aspects as such uh, from the digital strategies, et cetera. But uh, I want to step back a little bit and say, if you're a small uh, computer repair business and you're starting to play in a much bigger field, it is always good to sort of just sit back articulate clearly what exactly you want to achieve from a strategy perspective and that helps them drive exactly where you want to do and the kind of things you need to have in place and so clearly integration to an external source absolutely necessary and that of all shines when it comes to integration you'll have some additional heightened security and access requirements gdpr being one of them you will have to uh, essentially be able to rapidly address additional impacts or outside uh, demands from uh, outside organizations for the accreditation and so the ability to respond quickly having a clear statement of your strategy your approach and your uh, your rigor that you are putting in place will be necessary as part of that accreditation whether you like it or not more often or not so that's uh, i would say that that sort of uh, step back, do the strategic thinking, and then finding the approach that helps you to deal with those challenges are key. Now, Data Vault does and has reliably demonstrated that it does give you the ability to rapidly adapt and adopt and integrate across a number of bespoke or uh, heterogeneous systems. And so that does bring the necessary flexibility that you have. Now, the beauty, and this is sort of to your question, Julian, um, small organizations also tend to be, you know, me, myself, and I decide what is the best thing. And so sometimes uh, you get to do innovative things very quickly and very rapidly without too much sort of political drag and overhead and those type of things. So that is certainly the case uh, that you can do. So sometimes uh, Data Vault is achieved, but not because uh, people understand necessarily what they are subscribing to, but they essentially look at the features and functions thereafter, and you go, well, that's what Data Vault provides, and that is a, a, essentially a great springboard for you then to demonstrate and prove. Uh, like all business uh, uh, sponsors, they are somewhat skeptical, and that is excellent, which means that if you delight them, they are a champion for life. So those are the kind of opportunities that in small organizations really uh, is a little bit more exciting than large organizations. Less mm. politics, less issues to deal with, per se. But uh, mm. as a small organization, building a foundation like this, uh, where you can respond in a much broader environment with larger organizations and essentially outperforming the larger organizations, is certainly one of the things that you uh, can achieve uh, as such. So uh, all the best with taking the small repair business into a larger scheme. Yeah, it sounds like a, yeah. a journey, doesn't it? Michael? Um, yeah, just one, one comment. So, yeah. Sorry. We have seen multiple cases where a smaller, relatively smaller organization has built a data warehouse with, with Data Vault, 
had a solution running and they had to report and everything else, got taken over by a larger corporation and they realized, I mean, up in the new headquarters, they realized, well, our enterprise status is not as good as theirs. So they really had a, a struggle essentially. Yeah. And then when political concerns come in, when the smaller firm that you just purchased over can't have a better solution than yours, that's a, that's a really fun environment. But yeah, we've seen these, yeah. env- these, these situations a lot, actually. We, we have also seen that. And I think maybe when you're smaller, it's easier to be more agile, right, and do things in yeah. small, small chunks. You don't have big executives saying, oh, I want you know, the world. But do you, do you think that kind of applies, Michael, to someone who's dealing with a departmental solution as well, where they maybe can't, they're not part of an enterprise data warehouse, but a more a departmental warehouse. Is it the same mm-hmm. approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what we also have with a couple of clients where they built an enterprise data was with uh, with the department only, not for a central enterprise uh, or for the enter- for the central enterprise essentially. So that's why it is. What I always um, su- strongly suggest to them essentially is to establish standards. So if there's already some other department building on a data vault and they already have some standards in place, go there, use them. Even if you don't agree with them fully, right? Um, if it's good enough, if there's no mistake in it, if there's no uh, issue in it, go for it and use it because then you can essentially join these independently developed um, um, data solutions. You can join them as long as they follow the same standards, ha- naming conventions, hashing, especially hashing, and so yeah. on. So or modeling starts and so on. That's, that's what I would suggest, yeah. As they say, all good things must come to an end, and that's where we are for this week's episode of the Data Vault Radio Show. I want to thank Mike Kalusik again for joining me for this week's interview, and I want to thank you for joining me for the interview and the rest of the show. Don't forget to like and share or subscribe to the channel, let other people know what it is that we're doing so they can get something out of it as well. And also don't forget you can always join the Data Vault Innovators community, it's completely free. Just go to the website that's popping up on the page at the moment or in the description down below. Also, finally, don't forget next week, the DVIC Summit over in London. Uh, Make sure you jump onto the Scale Free website or learn more about it in the DVIC forums. It's completely free and it's a great way to network and meet a whole bunch of people as well as do a couple of different workshops around data vault and data management. Until next week, I will catch you later. Please make sure you look after yourself and don't forget to live long and prosper.